Uh, hey, Paul, it's me, Wolfie. Uh, what kind of agent are you? You told me the Letterman gig was a lock for me. Okay, so that means I get the Colbert slot? Chris Hardwick? Shouldn't he come on after my show and discuss what happened on it? Okay, who gets his midnight slot? Amy Schumer. All right, well, that opens up the Inside Amy Schumer half hour. Craig Ferguson is taking over Inside Amy? Isn't that a step backward? Okay, well, who gets his show? Harriet Jones? Come on, I know Harriet Jones. She's nice, but she's mainly Scottish. What do they do in that time slot? Macbeth skits every night? Look, I see how this works. One window closes, but it makes another one open, and then that window closes, and then another one opens, and so on, right? No, I don't want a window. God, you're the worst agent. No, Paul, I'm asking you this. After all these other people are done leapfrogging one step forward, what finally opens up for me? (laughs) North Dakota Community Access? That can be a springboard. Do I have Polka Spotlight as a lead-in? Huh, preventing livestock theft is even better. Half the audience uses it as a dating site, if you know what I mean. Do they agree to two bottles of Fiji water in the dressing room every night? Galvanized metal pail with a ladle is very hipster, very Etsy. Fiji is so last year anyway. Okay, Paul, make the deal. The rest of you get ready for the nose. We've got plenty to talk about. And now he accidentally created Heartbleed while trying to tweet a picture of his cat, Colin McEnroe. Yeah, that's not exactly true, but I, I do know that they will eventually bl- blame Heartbleed on some old person like me using the internet wrong. You know, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be somebody's mother trying to put something up on Facebook, and it caused this horrible thing which wrecked everybody's uh, internets. All right, so, uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. Here on the nose, we have so many other things on our minds, uh, starting with, in fact, the the, the ascension of Stephen Colbert, if that's the right word, I think it is the right word, the ascension of Stephen Colbert to the late night show vacated by David Letterman. That'll all happen probably right at the beginning of 2015, um, but has some kind of interesting implications, which uh, I hope we can talk about uh, in the second segment. We will talk uh, once again, because he just never quite leaves us alone, uh, about the indictment of former governor uh, and more recently a talk show host, John <coughs> Rowland. Uh, also towards the end, we'll talk about the latest update of the papyrus uh, that seems to suggest that at least in one gospel, I want to say this as accurately as possible, that at least one gospel, Jesus is seen to speak of a wife. Uh, and so we have with us, uh, I mean, one reason we have to talk about this is uh, we have with us today Susan Campbell, uh, who, one, whose books include Dating Jesus. So, like, how could we not talk about whether Jesus had a wife or not? Although, uh, more recently, uh, her biography of Isabella Hooker is what everybody's talking about right now. And the name of the biography is... Tempest Toss, The Spirit of Isabella Beecher Hooker. All right. And from uh, you'll hear more about that later uh, as we ruthlessly plug her appearance next week. <laughs> uh, James Hanley is here from Trinity Cine Studio just passing around flyers that look like it's going to be a, a great schedule coming up ahead. Uh, and uh, from Trinity College, Professor Luis Figueroa is with us. We are going to start. And by the way, if you have things that you want to say, we are going to start. You please call us, 860-275-7266. 860-275-7266. You may tweet at us. You may tweet us at WNPR Colin. Um, you know, with this move by Colbert, which, you know, in some ways is sort of the entertainment business who cares about it. Except that I do, I would argue that Colbert is kind of a unique figure. And, you know, James, one thing that has happened is that it's almost as if for about an hour every night at Comedy Central, Voltaire has taken over television programming. And these two guys, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert, really kind of try to hold the political establishment and the media establishment accountable in a way that almost nobody else does. Mm-hmm. And, and as, as great as he, as happy as he may be about getting to be the new David Letterman, we may actually lose something pretty significant when he goes. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, I sort of, part of me thinks that, okay, he's looking at this as, you know, his, he wants to change, he wants to do something different, and this is an opportunity, and I congratulate him for that. But, you know, on the other hand, I think he's one of the most, well, he is probably the sharpest intelligence on TV doing this kind of thing. And the satisfaction that comes from actually living on that knife edge of is he Stephen Colbert or is he the character 
is endlessly entertaining. I mean, I watch it because you, you never know where exactly it's going. And it must be incredibly stimulating for him to be in that interaction with audience and, and, and like really every night it seems I'm obviously there's scripting, but it also has a kind of spontaneity about it, about reactions and about how he describes himself. And where is he at that particular moment in time? I can't believe that that won't be a loss for him, too. Uh, and I th certainly think it'll be a loss for us. I mean, politically, to see somebody who's on that side of really like, like zeroing in on the essence of political discourse, I, I, I think that'll be a real loss. Well, just as an act of performance, it didn't seem seven years ago as though this would be possible. You right. know, that, that somebody would be able to wear this mask of the strutting, pompous, right-wing windbag and also somehow or other let the mask slip occasionally and be himself and, and speak as himself. But as you suggest, James, I mean, he does it every night. Every night, you know, he's wearing the mask and every once in a while you just see him looking through the mask with his real face at you and the whole thing kind of holds together uh, to a remarkable degree. So, Luis, what were your thoughts about this? Well, first of all, I think that um, the combination of John Stewart and Colbert became uh, for a considerable amount of people in this country uh, the Walter Conkite mm -hmm. of the 21st century. Um, in, back in those days, those of you who were here in this country would know that uh, everyone got the news and um, from the 6.30 uh, broadcast in the evening news and especially from Cronkite. And I think that for a significant number of people in this country, this w became the evening news. Now that it was just simply late evening news with a great deal of satire and parody and uh, pretty punching comedy, which I think made it even more forceful than simply reading the news and straight out reporting. Uh, so to that extent, this is um, a great loss for the country, um, not only for people who might align themselves politically with Stuart and Colbert, but even for people who might not, because in a certain way of keeping them uh, with a certain perspective. Um, I, was, I think that for Colbert, what is remarkable is that at the same time that he was doing this character, he was also doing what I would say is himself. So it was, there's a dialectic in, in the way he portrayed the character. Uh, lastly, for now, um, my, my concern, too, is that the, the criticism in the show was not only in both shows. It's not only about the politicians. It's about the media establishment. A significant amount of the criticism in both shows is the media establishment, the mainstream media. So to that extent, for him to go to mainstream media, I think, will probably like tie up his hands to some extent. That's my fear. You know, um, Susan Campbell, I'm sure you have many things to say about this. And not to make you all about uh, religion either, mm -hmm. um, although you're the only person here who went to seminary. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So Which makes me special. Makes you very special. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about Colbert, one of the many ways he is different from anybody else doing a job like his, to the best of our knowledge anyway, is that he's a very serious, believing, devout Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, I quote, I think this is from the LA Times, uh, the man, no, maybe the Washington Post, the man in reality and character is a, dev is a devout and out Catholic, observer of Lent and teacher of Sunday school. Unlike other comedians of his persuasion, liberal though disguised as conservative, Colbert does not hide, ignore, downplay, or make light of his faith. On Ash Wednesday, he shows up with the obligatory smudge on his forehead. He has been known to recite bits of the Nicene Creed on the air. He has appointed a smart and articulate Jesuit, Father John Martin, as official chaplain of his show. And I assume he takes all these sensibilities over to the Letterman slot where um, you just don't see that. No, you don't. And I don't know if you remember when his mother was so sick before she died. I think he let the mask down just for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I found it refreshing. And I don't want to be the contrarian, but I guess I will. I'm looking forward to what, what is next. I'm looking forward to seeing him with his real hair. Does he lacquer his hair in real life? There was a quote, I don't know if it was in the Times, where one of his New Jersey neighbors said, yeah, he's a regular guy. I can hit him on the back of the head, which I guess is high praise. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I would like to see what Comedy Central puts in that time slot. They can't replace him, but God knows what they could come up with. They're fairly talented. Well, I, I want to come back to the religion thing in a second, but obviously one of the things that will be interesting to see is, I mean, every every decision at, on late night television, every time you think it's not going to be a white male this time, it's a white male. Uh, Wouldn't yeah. it be nice that that be different? So they've got Key and Peele available. They've got Amy Schumer available. They they have even within their own kind of roster some other possibilities. I mean, within the, uh, the, the Daily Show itself, there are people like Samantha 
be and uh, that's my choice. I think be. we should start a Twitter yeah, revolution. She's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. But you know, I just want to go back to the religion thing sure. for a second because it really is. I mean, within the world that we live in, and within the media world that we live in, it's so on you. I mean, I think in some ways it's the it's the really remarkable thing about Colbert. And I was talking earlier this week in a conversation with Thomas More about this play I'd seen Freud's last session in which. You know, it's Freud talking to C.S. Lewis, but you, C.S. Lewis seems under undergunned somehow <laughs> in this conversation. They, they sort of don't really give C.S. Lewis the same kind of intellectual firepower that they give Freud, even in that play. Even though I think the playwright means it to be something like a fair, fair fighter and even match, but it's not. You could see the bias. You could see the bias, yeah. yeah. And to have somebody like this in a role that's you know, and and they're. Couldn't be a more, you know, rigorous media nihilist than David Letterman. Not that he rejects religion necessarily, but he just has rejected everything. Yeah. So I, it'll be very interesting to see how he threads, how Colbert threads this particular needle. Well, I, he's done well on Comedy Central. You know his politics and you know his religion. I'm assuming he's going to be the same. I don't know what the real person's like. Um, frankly, I would get so tired of putting that fake persona on. I, I imagine he's a little happy not to have – I go back to the hair, not to lacquer the hair. But I would I would look to see mentions of faith in there and that would be fun. I, I also think that the context in which this is happening now is very um, uh, interesting. It's, it's a coincidence, I guess, is that um, the fact that Francis is now the pope mm-hmm. and the kind of politics or, or, or theology and lifestyle and so on – that he has been uh, putting on uh, since he was elected a pope creates an opening for, I think, for Catholics who are more liberal, um, even more radical, like in the old days, used to be back in the 60s and 70s in Latin America. I have a very, very close friend, a very dear friend, who is a uh, a, a, a Franciscan lay brother, an academic, uh, a scientist in his field, to put it some way, uh, and he's been very, always very open about his Catholicism, and he's a very, very liberal individual. So I, 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 I won because I came from Latin America, where uh, Catholicism in the 60s and 70s had a strain that was very radical. I don't see a contradiction between the two of them. And in fact, I admire people who are on that side of, of the political equation, who are uh, well, also openly religious. Um, yeah, go ahead, James. No, I was going to say one of the interesting aspects of this is reinvention to me, that that... You know, if you're in a position like I can't see him, for instance, forever doing the Colbert report that that as an artist and as an intelligent sort of, you know, inventive person, he's going to want to have some sort of way to grow. And I think there's an expectation in that show that he be that character. So I, I laud him for sort of taking a chance on this. And he's a smart enough guy that he may make it his own. But in the background of this, too, I think, is the fact that both shows, uh, both the Comedy Central, which is Viacom and CBS, they're both large corporations with large advertising budgets, and that plays into it as well. And one of the things that I've always found kind of particularly edgy about his appearance on on, on the Colbert Report is that he almost trashes the, the sponsors, he almost trashes their products, but doesn't quite. And it's sort of like it, it, there's kind of there, OK, realizing who's actually paying the bills here. And so it's a difficult place to be. But I think CBS is maybe a little less likely to want that to happen. It's hard to tell, but I think he's smart enough that maybe he can twist that if he has a strong following that the show develops a new identity, then he can probably get away with it. But I think that's a very interesting background. It's a to great question. Thing. And all you need to, to know to think more about this, or all you need to do, is go back and watch the movie American Splendor about Harvey Picar. Harvey Picar, right. for a long time, was kind of a favorite pet of Letterman's, except that Letterman just regarded him as this kind of endearing oddball with no social skills, which is the kind of person, particularly early in Letterman's career, that he was very good at having on and celebrating. And you had your Larry Bud. Melman's and your brother Theodore's and stuff like that. And he just thought Harvey Picar was another one of those guys. At a certain point, Picar really wanted to take Letterman on about NBC, about GE's ownership of NBC, about other stuff that GE was doing. And Letterman froze up on him and became, in that one famous exchange, I mean, just absolutely livid. And, And you suddenly realize that Letterman was really only interested in being marginally transgressive. Well, exactly. his paycheck. I mean, you, mm-hmm. where are your loyalties? 
and and also, I mean, really, who David Letterman is—he comes kind of out of the heartland, and he's he's not a guy interested in having conversations and batting things around with a ra- real radical kind of person. Can I drop a name really quick? You may. At the Wichita Eagle Beacon, I worked with his sister Gretchen, and every year they would go back to Indiana, I think, to mm-hmm. have their church bulletin picture taken as a family. That's all I got. The Letterman's would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You're which, welcome. Which name are you? Sister Gretchen? Gretchen name Letterman, yeah. who I yeah. really liked. But in the, in the, in the, going back for a second to, uh, to Colbert, uh, we should remember that uh, in his show, there is a segment where he's interviewing people. Mm-hmm. And that segment perhaps gives us a clue as to how he will uh, uh, deal with people in the, in the conversations in the talk show. Although, of course, not in a character necessarily. Um, uh, and, and I think that he demonstrated uh, to be a great interviewer. Um, putting aside for a moment all the parody of the conservative, he was a very, uh, in his show, he's always been a very witty interviewer who reacts to what people, in, a, in, in very quick thinking in his feet, uh, what people are saying. Uh, so that gives me a great deal of uh, hope that the show, in terms of the conversation with the guests, would be a, a, you know, not exactly the dull show that some of these talks uh, well, could that- be. Yeah, that that may actually be one of the reasons why I think CBS wants it is that that one thing that is obvious is that the competition and the fragmentation of media generally means that having somebody as strong as that uh, who has a following and who's capable of thinking on his feet, that can be something that makes it distinctive and makes people watch. And that, I think, may be why they want to take a chance on him that he's in some ways may be something of a loose cannon but I'd be I'd, I'd be kind of interested to know the details of the contract you know yeah. not, well, like what can you do yeah. what can he what, what can, can he get away with there, right. is, there is a number to follow up on what you're saying James a very good point is uh, that was in the media reported that the Letterman show since um, uh, Fallon took over in NBC has dropped significantly in in the ratings especially for the uh under 40 uh, uh, audience, I mean, by 17% in the last few weeks since Safaron took over on NBC. So in in that way, I'm sure that CBS is welcoming the the retirement, and who knows if that played a role in that man's decision to step down now. Are we talking about this a lot because one of us wants Stephen Colbert's job? No, I think that's... (laughs) (laughs) I I, I know they thought about James for a while, but... uh, I don't think so. He was busy. (laughs) I I think we're also talking about this a lot. I mean, this is also a very, very tired format, this whole thing. Somebody comes out, they tell some jokes uh, in a monologue for a while, then there's a little bit of conceptual or sketched comedy, and then the interviews start and there might be some music and wow I mean they've got it going on on all these different channels but they don't nobody really does anything different with it right. and, and you really do feel like some yeah. some though somebody as restless as Colbert who has already done a show that resembles really no other show mm-hmm. um, the likelihood that he'll do a show that would resemble anybody else's show seems lower and the other thing I would say about this guy is and it's interesting when you hear him interviewed Terry Gross has done a series of fairly penetrating interviews with him uh, where this intelligence comes out. But even I saw him go on Jim, uh, uh, Jimmy Kimmel's show and be interviewed. And the little lines and references that he tosses off in a very unscripted way, at one point I think they were talking about something about babies or children or uh, and whether babies watch the shows or something. And and, and uh, Colbert says, yeah, well, we, th- we specialize in object permanence over on the oh, Colbert nice. Report. <laughs> That's kind of a Piaget kind of <laughs> reference, you know. I don't think Jimmy Kimmel would have thrown oh, – it wasn't. It was Jimmy Fallon. I'm sorry. J- Jimmy Fallon. I don't think either one of those guys would have thrown off a little Piaget joke about uh, object permanence. Uh, you know, this this is a guy who reads and thinks. Uh, I watched him not live, but I've seen the, the, the tape of him in Sondheim's company where he acquits himself like, you know, I mean, a full-blown Broadway yeah, that's performer right. with yeah. significant singing chops and stuff like that. This is the guy, I mean, one thing that's happened, I mean, Fallon is a little bit a part of this trend, too. They suddenly have some of these late-night show hosts who can actually do something. Besides talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so who's going to break the barrier of the white dudes behind a desk? Well, Samantha Bee's one nomination. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd vote for Samantha Bee. I mean. Chris Rock. I would say that. I would turn uh, him I, I, Okay, yeah, I, I would say that uh, even though, uh, you know, cable is not the same as broadcast and you can get away with a lot of things on cable, she might not be hired because she's beyond uh, edgy for a lot of people. For far, my vote would be for Sarah Silverman. Sarah Silverman? So, yep. I mean, one of the things you have to think about is, and, and Letterman talked about, has talked about this at times too, that he, uh, I, I'm trying to remember how he put it. Bill Curry was 
talking to me about this the other day, but in interviews, he said that sometimes that he, he gradually realized that the role of host was more important than the joke. And that sometimes he'd have to sacrifice the joke, whatever it was, for the role of host. Mm -hmm. Because the reality of these shows are, if you watch them, it, it is like a date. You know, it's a regular date you have for four nights a week with another human being. And, and yeah, you might watch uh, Stewart and Colbert because their, their satire and their ability to kind of hold, hold powerful people accountable is really impressive. And it fascinates you. And it's, it's, there's just a lot of interesting logic even <laughs> that goes into their shows that you don't hear anywhere else. But really with these kind of late night things, it's, you, you got to like the person. You've got to be comfortable enough with the person. Now, I think Sarah Silverman is really funny. But as is the case with Chris Rock, 80 percent of their acts would have to go. I mean, you know, 80 percent of what we like about them. Their is jokes. So that you yeah. simply cannot say on late night television. Uh, and I'm not sure people want to be with Sarah Silverman every night. You know, <laughs> <laughs> What's the rule well, I, I here? I guess I am in a minority. <laughs> What's the rule here? Do you sacrifice jokes so that other people can talk? Well, I, the rule here? The rule here is if you think about my the shift from the show that I did for 16 years on WTIC, which was much more about me and about me being funny in a certain way. And when I got here, I just realized there was no place for that. Mm. But, you know, public radio is about a different kind of content. So, yeah, you do. Conversation more so. Right. And you get out of other people's way. Yeah. Uh, and So can I sit there after the break? Yeah, you want to? Okay. All right. No, it's, you know, <laughs> it's nothing but fretting. You know? <laughs> I'm uh, lying. I don't nothing, want it. <laughs> nothing but cold sweat. All right. Well, um, we're going to take a break right now because we've got two other topics we want to uh, cover. I'm sorry if you didn't get on the air. A couple of people sort of called in and then I, I didn't get to them fast enough and they hung up and I feel bad about that. Stephen always fights for truth and justice and the American way. And he'll say the things uncouth that was John Stewart's too scared to say. And forget about Geraldo who once got hit by a chair. God bless Stephen Colbert. All right, we're back with the nose. <clears throat> Susan Campbell, James Hanley, and Luis Figueroa are here in studio with us. Uh, Joan Carroll tweeted during the previous segment, don't forget the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Uh, hashtag good lord. Um, <laughs> and we did sort of forget to talk about that, but it is an amazing ex example of Colbert being able to completely flummox the audience in front of him while communicating exquisitely with the people who are going to see it uh, on the television feed or on, on YouTube afterwards. So um, we are going to move on here. I, I do wonder when and if I am going to do my last ever John Rowland show. Or when you my, die. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> or write my last John Rowland column. It just doesn't ever seem to come. So uh, last night, as I was getting ready to go to the gym, uh, I was conferring on the phone with somebody who said, well, I thought the indictment was going to be today. And I said, well, it doesn't really look like that. Um, I went to the gym. Uh, I went from the gym to the grocery store. In the grocery store, I ran into Steve Metcalf, who said, well, you know that uh, your friend John Rowland got indicted. And I thought, wow, you can't just, you can't take an hour off here. It's just, you got to watch <laughs> at all times. So John Rowland, in fact, has been indicted. Seven different counts. They do um, apply, in fact, to his, his involvement. I, I'm sort of like a Rolandologist. I shouldn't I should just sit here and be a resource for the other three of you. Uh, I mean, I know way too much about this story. I know way too much about all John Rowland's stories. I really should be just the reference librarian <laughs> Can for the I rest of you, this conversation. <laughs> forgive me for interrupting. Go May ahead. I ask you a question then? Yeah. Given my past life of crime, right. you learn one of two things when you are arrested for being naughty. One, you learn that you shouldn't do that and don't do it again. Or two, you learn to do it better. But he managed to not learn any, either of those things and repeated his sins of the past. That wasn't a question, but it was a great observation. I'm getting to the question. I like building up to my five-minute long question. Why? Why okay. do you do it? Yeah, I, I think I do have sort of an answer. First of all, um, people may want to chime in about this or they may be exhausted with the topic. Either way, 860-275-7266. 860-275-7266. I'm pretty sure I have written – I think I've written my last Joe Lieberman column. Probably had my last Joe Lieberman show. Someday I will have my last John Rowland experience, but, <laughs> but not yet. You know um, – in 2002, the then existent Northeast Magazine of the Hartford Current hired me to write a piece that was called Why We Love the Gov. Uh, and that's what they wanted to call it. And they wanted somebody who was a, a diehard critic of John Rowland to write a piece 
to try to figure out why people like him so much, why he wins elections, et cetera. Um, and so I did. It was, it was an interesting experience. But I, they, they said I had to start from the premise that people do like him and there must be a reason. And it was an interesting thought experiment, as they say. Uh, but one of the people I talked to, it was uh, Paul Teeger, who's a personality expert. He studies Myers-Briggs type personality um, classifications. And, and he had been quite a, an observer of Roland. And he said, you know, what he is, he's, actually he said there's two kinds of cops. He said there's the kind of cop who really is in it to protect and serve, you know, and law and order and protection and service and the, the notion uh, of kind of a civic good. And there's another kind of cop who runs on adrenaline uh, and, and is in it for the adrenaline. And he, he said if Roland were a cop, he'd be that second kind of cop and that he is what in the world of personality classification is called an experiencer. And, and Paul Teeger said, in that kind of person, they, they deal with what's in front of them at any given moment. Like a two-year-old. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not here to layer on my own judgments. I'm just telling okay. you. What, but yeah, they, they, they deal what's in front of them at the, at the moment. They, this problem, this meal, this parking space, this whatever it is, it's in front of them. They are dealing with it. They are not thinking a week out, two weeks out, three weeks out. They're not thinking long-term consequences and, and ramifications. And he felt that John Rowland was the epitome of that um, and was not asking himself some of these long-term questions. Do, does the experiencer tend to go into politics, something really visible? They, I don't know whether that, that's uh, – you'd have to ask Paul about that. Although one thing that he uh, – Paul was very helpful to me in understanding Rowland because another thing he said about John Rowland is that um, – sort of uh, Myers-Briggs and, and systems like this, they divide people into two, in, two, two axes in, in four different ways. But one of the axes is the sensor versus the intuitive. So the intuitive looks at sort of underlying meaning, uh, asks multiple questions about things, explores any given thing for its deeper ramifications, uh, is capable of holding two or three different mildly contradictory ideas in, his, in their own heads uh, at any given time. Whereas the censor, and uh, for James's benefit, I will bring in a cinematic reference, uh, in The Deer Hunter, the moment when Robert De Niro holds up a, a cartridge and he's yelling at John Cassale and he says, you see this, Stan? This is this. Mm -hmm. It's not some other thing. <laughs> it's this. That's how censors think. They think about – and 65 percent of America uh, or 65 percent of the world are censors. Uh, they, don't, they don't explore deep meanings. They, they see what's there and they talk about it. And one of the reasons Roland was an effective politician was he could speak to people in a way that they absolutely understood. They were never uncertain about what he was saying. Well, at the same time, you know, I think he had a contempt for the voters because I, one of the stories that's most interesting that forever sort of uh, zeroed in my impression of it, kind of a low-rent Richard Nixon is that um, he, he uh, when was caught over the hot tub affair, he went on TV and said, oh, uh, it was just some kitchen cabinets were put in there by, you know, they were Home Depot cabinets. And in fact, they were... Ca craftsman Custom. cabinets by a skilled carpenter whose wife then went on TV and exploded and said what a contemptuous thing to say <laughs> about something that was actually a theft from the public which was a lovely sort of like like nexus of exactly who Roland is and I, I, I've never forgotten that. So at least acknowledge they were really nice cabinets. Yeah. Um, the exactly. other thing that happened at that time and it, it, it has repeated itself, um, he did go before the press at that time and say that um, those home improvements were paid for by a home equity loan. Um, and I, I remember actually listening to this with uh, the person with whom I live. Uh, and she said to me, without even really looking up, she said, he doesn't have a home equity loan. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, that's ridiculous because, I mean, that's such a checkable thing. I mean, the, you know, John Lender can go and verify this immediately because it attaches to the deed and, you know. Uh, and uh, so he wouldn't lie about it. She said he doesn't have a home equity loan. <laughs> and, <laughs> and turns out. And turns out she was out. right. He did not have a home equity loan, So, which is a remarkable thing to do, to go in front of a bunch of people like investigative reporters like John Lender and say you have something, which they can very easily figure out that you don't. I, I want to go back to um, the comment that you made um, uh, from this person you talked to about uh, the cop that is, uh, runs on the adrenaline, and the adrenaline is what has that, that cop on the job. Uh, that kind of cop would volunteer for do all kinds of more risky things, being in special kind of uh, teams or forces or SWATs and so on, uh, I'm sure trying to, to visualize that individual. And what 
from from the, what I've read about Roland in this particular case, what strikes me is that he seems to to definitely run on some kind of adrenaline in terms of being involved in politics, because he he was he's barred from being in politics, I suppose. Right? That's what the, the press and you have been saying uh, in recent weeks. And yet he had to feel that he was doing something. He wanted to be uh, caught. He wanted to be involved in politics. And the only way he saw doing it was mm-hmm. by doing these consultancies. But this was you know, something that would become very controversial. And who knows if, if he could legally do it or not. Um, and what is behind it, too, is his sense that he knows the state of Connecticut. And he knows the politics. And he knows the people here better than no other political consultant. And he will be able to manipulate things so that these candidates that he was trying to help will get elected. Because in the emails that are quoted, he says, you know, your, um, your main campaign or campaign chief will tell you that I'm not good, and I, but I know the voters in Connecticut and so on and so forth. So he felt that he could manipulate us in, in a particular way, like he did when he was in front of the camera, as opposed to now, in this case, behind a computer writing emails. Uh, yeah, you've got a theory, James, right? Well, I, that's why I made the Richard Nixon r- reference, because I think that Richard Nixon really deeply wanted to be caught, like really, really caught. Uh, and, and, and all of his, like underneath, underneath of all of his plotting and his, his paranoia about being hated and about people who are after him, I think that Roland has the same sort of thing, that, that he, he has this sort of dual thing of having this perceived connection with the voters, yet he behaves contemptuously towards them. And therefore, to me, that reads as somebody, okay, he knows that he's, he knows where he is and who he is. And there's this deep desire to get caught. Because if you look at the things that he did, I mean, it, could it be just that he's ignorant about email and electronic stuff? No, I, people do stuff like that, I think, because they are ultimately there's a discordance there. There's a there's a dissonance in the way they're behaving and who they really are. And to me, it's like, you know, I wonder if inwardly he feels a kind of relief when he gets caught. I, I don't know. It, it would explain. I mean, I, I want to go to uh, calls from Ned and, and from Jim, but it does explain something that, that does happen pretty frequently. But I, I was astonished this time around. Um, I mean, I think most people understand that sending an email – is a lot less <laughs> like sending a letter and a lot more like typing something that's going to go up on one of those screens they have on the highway telling you <laughs> that there's going to be night construction. And learn to spell <laughs> in your email and learn punctuation, please. I, mean, I think most people just understand how incredibly easily obtainable these emails are, either through FOI laws or subpoenas or whatever. And, and so many people – I mean when I read last night, once again, every time I think I've read the last thing – uh, but going through the the federal allegations uh, as the indictment was posted last night, the idea that he had actually, with in his first attempt to uh, create a fictitious con- uh, contract as a political consultant, the first time with Mark Greenberg, who turned him down, he actually wrote the contract himself and then emailed it to somebody else just to show <laughs> to it to it. them. <laughs> and I'm thinking, You're do, awesome. you not, do you not know? But maybe James is right. Maybe this is all part of some very, very deeply buried wish for self-destruction. Let me just grab a call or two here. We can keep this conversation going. This is Ned in West Hartford. Hi, Ned. Hey, Colin. Um, all your ruminations and summations sort of remind me about the clean energy investigation. You have uh, you have gas and you have torches. It's, it, it, and it was just stupid, just like John Rowland. He's just plain stupid. Why would he do it again? Yeah, I, you know, I mean... Uh, I mean, well, I, it, uh, because the James, thrill, the yeah. thrill of it, because the thrill of being caught. I, yeah. Well, yeah, actually, that's Luis is also saying that too. The adrenaline uh, oh, really. is is probably a big part of it, and I mean, it is true that you know I keep going back to uh, everything's a movie analogy today, but uh, Hal Holbrook standing there in the in the garage uh, in uh, All the President's Men, and at one point he says to Robert Redford. This isn't the brightest bunch of guys in the world. <laughs> hey, uh, right. So maybe a little bit uh, of that there. Let me grab one more call from uh, Jim in Bloomfield. Hi, Jim. Hi there. Um, I don't really have a movie analogy to offer, but I'm, it, it occurs to me that perhaps we really are overthinking this a little bit. We've got a guy who just seems to be incapable of being honest. Uh, he's proven time and again to be deceitful. Uh, James used the phrase, a theft from the public, and I can think of all kinds of things that he has taken from us, including uh, 
uh, the principle of justice with his um, now apparently quite too early release from prison. Um, you know, this is a guy who's just untrustworthy, and in that regard, he's he's probably a lot more common than we want to think. Um, I'm I'm pretty disgusted by all of this. I can't wait to see him uh, get another day in court where I hope justice really will be served. All right. Um, well, that begins at 2.30 today, but Okay, in her new capacity as a chaplain of the Colin McEnroe show. I, I, Does that pay? No. Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> Figures. You know, I've been really sort of struggling with the question. I mean, watching this this downfall, and it is a downfall. It is. It's a second downfall, and it's a downfall that will ripple out. It will obviously affect his wife, who may or may not be culpable in a lot of this stuff. It will affect his kids, uh, who I think really do look up to him. Uh, it will affect all kinds of people. And it is the idea of anybody going back to prison a second time uh, is, you know, I mean, one's sympathies are run the risk of being aroused anyway. And And so I've been really struggling with this question of, whether I feel sorry for this man or not, whether – I mean there's two concepts, I guess, sympathy and mercy. Um, and and I, I know as much about his wrongdoings as probably just about anybody who's not employed as a federal prosecutor or an FBI investigator. I mean I really do know a lot about a lot of the things that he has done wrong and gotten away with for the most part going back decades. And yet I don't know. I'm very – I'm torn about this. You know? Do you feel like you should be able to – Forgive him, or I, yeah, because he's not Idi Amin. I mean, he's he's a he kind didn't of kill he, anyone. he's a dirty politician, uh, you know. And but I mean, he's not Idi I mean, He hasn't done really horrible things. So so would it be karmically, spiritually good for me if I just if I were able to find some kind of sympathy and mercy? Probably yes. But when you ri- mentioned Richard Nixon, I will go to my grave cheerfully disliking that man. <laughs> and I do wonder sometimes because someone says Nixon and I'm on point because yeah. let me tell you about that guy. I didn't know the guy. Mm. Um, probably for both of our sakes, we should find some for whether it's forgiveness or an understanding that he's messed up. If you are so anxious to feel the adrenaline or get caught and the thrill of getting caught is worth risking so much for your family if not yourself then probably somewhere in there we could find i'm not suggesting i'm going to but it might be a good thing well isn't isn't that a personal sense of somebody who's transgressed that you can forgive that that as an individual maybe somebody you know and you find it in your heart to forgive even a heinous thing that they've done toward you personally But I think there's another level on this, which is as a public official, somebody who is like who's taken on being a public official as their career. There's a whole other level that I don't think that that is a matter of forgiveness. That's a matter of being caught with the goods. I mean, it's very simple to me. I I don't think that that is a matter of forgiveness. I think on a personal sense, you can say, well, I'm sorry for the guy. And Maybe it's a that. Shame. Yeah, I uh, inserted forgiveness into yeah. the conversation, but there was a lot of talk the first time around of public trust. Yes, the public yeah, trust, yeah, and absolutely, and I, that is so so relevant right now in terms of how we live. Public trust, and when you trash that public trust, to me, that's a real high crime and misdemeanor. I mean, it's very serious. Hmm. Um, Betsy Kaplan is the only grown-up affiliated with the show. Is sort of saying that I should. Find something, whether it's sympathy, empathy, whatever we're going to call it, that I should – one should find something. Maybe you should walk heart. away from him for a while. Take a break. I and need to quit him. <laughs> well, bef- before we uh, end this uh, conversation about this, we, we do want to save a little bit of time for uh, the possible wife of Jesus. Um, Luis, did you want to say something? I, I posted today on the Hartford Current website a 1990 uh, official congressional photograph of John Rowland when he was uh, a congressman from the 5th District. Uh, and in it, he has – um, straight out of American Hustle. Say it. Yep. Uh, he has what is sometimes referred to as a porn star mustache. Um, or, you know, but also if you've seen American Hustle, there's a lot of that kind of facial hair too. So is there something? First of all, I, I, I would say that um, uh, I know when you post certain things on Facebook about Roland, uh, there are some people who comment quite critical of what you're saying. Uh, I think that the, the, the an earlier um, a column that you wrote very recently about him where you were Talking about the the rat in Charlotte's Web, um, uh, that 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 was one of the better columns that I read. And then I run into this one uh, with that picture and the thing about signing the emails, uh, love the gov. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I look at that picture, and that picture to me uh, can be read in many ways. One of them is he was. This is 1990. 
Mm -hmm. This is when he was a congressman. He was elected congressman when he was 27. Isn't mm -hmm. that right? Yes. So he knew, it seems to me that from that picture, he knew from the beginning, I'm doing things that you don't know, and I'm getting away <laughs> with it, kind of <laughs> grin under the hair uh, and his mustache over his upper lip that seems to be like trying to hide who really this guy is. Mm -hmm. because, well, because the green there in that picture is I am getting away with things and I will get away with things for the rest of my life in the state of Connecticut. So in the words of Rod Stewart, every picture tells a story, <laughs> don't it? All right. Uh, do we even have time to talk about the wife? We have to talk. See, we have the author of Dating Jesus here. We have to say something about this. About Jesus. So, um, well, about, I mean, in fact, th this question, all right, there's this controversial scrap of papyrus that may or may not have been part of the non-canonical Gospel of Thomas uh, that in which uh, it appears that Jesus uh, is quoted uh, as saying something like, my wife, she is able to be my disciple. Um, now, the, well, there's been all kind of Da Vinci Code type speculation about this and some questions about whether it was even legit, whether it even would survive the, the other kind of dating, the carbon dating. Uh, but it's, it appears to. It appears to be old enough anyway. Now, I mean, there's so many things to say about this and we have so little time. But, and, and one of the things that we have to say is that the, the Gospels that became canonical – I mean, it was either an arbitrary or divinely influenced process by which certain books about Jesus, written at more or less the same time, became part of the Gospels, came, became part of the canon. So it may not even mean anything mm -hmm. other than at a certain time, maybe there were a few hundred people who thought he had a wife. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think what they found this most, and this really surfaced last, no, I'm sorry, the fall of 2012, I think. And the woman who has been championing this keeps saying this is not an indication specifically that Jesus had a wife. But look at just the just the suggestion that he might have, and, and people pee all over the floor. It's incredible. What I would invite them to do— This is the chaplain of her. This is, the, how, this this is, is Reverend Campbell speaking about urine. Um, no, I'm done with it. I, I would invite people who really worry about this kind of thing to do a little research and see how the, the books that you read in your Christian Bible were assembled, and then that might make you not worry so much about this scrap of paper. I would suggest that there were were women who were disciples. I'm totally okay if he was married. And you've got generations of priests going, ah, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> so get over yourselves, people but, who are worried. But the reason people care a little bit is so much of the church's teaching is based on women sitting in the back pew. And wouldn't it be fabulous if we all get to heaven and women aren't sitting in the back pew? That's my vote. Right. But I think that I, I, I want to follow on this is the historicity of this, because I think that to me, um, the, the issue of the wife and that she could be a disciple and so on is fundamental in this controversy. But even as big as that is to remind people that the Gospels are not the Gospels in the, in the, in the, in the metaphorical sense of the word gospel. Um, there were other Gospels that have been written about. I saw years ago a great documentary on public television that dealt with this. And, and if you look at um, Professor King's uh, the, 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 the scholar behind the text, uh, her page at Harvard uh, describing her, she's the author of several books. It's, this is not uh, some, some wacko writing about this thing. She has also written a book about um, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. So uh, people have to keep in mind that these things were written well after uh, the life of the historical Jesus. Uh, they were not at that point. Um, James, if you can say something really quick. Uh, we well, uh, just the one thing I would say is that all the obsession with sort of dating this piece of paper and sort of carbon dating and so on, isn't it possible that it really, really is really, really old and will be verified, but that at the time the person who did it had an agenda and and maybe they did frauds then too. So <laughs> right. what do you know? Yeah, that's that's all you really do know is that somebody said that way back then. All right, we, we in order to have time for endorsements, we gotta go. I have been given treasures in heaven. I'll not reply. I shall not reply. Onward I'm going, happy in knowing Jesus is mine. If it turns out we all have to change our passwords, I feel bad for Roadrunner. Everything is beep beep. Gmail, Facebook, pin code. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our intern is Skylar Magnoli. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Katie Talarski is our executive producer. The part of Bill Curry was played by Tom Snyder. 
for show pages, articles, and a video of the Faith Middleton Show staff throwing their shoes at Hillary Clinton, visit WNPR.org. On Monday, we're back with the news of the weekend on The Scramble. And now, back to Colin. All right, yes, one of our favorite writers, Jen Dahl, will be joining me for a a conversation on The Scramble. So it's time for endorsements. Uh, And so here we go. Luis Figueroa, what have Uh, you got? Well, I have an endorsement here. The topic of binge watching has been a very recurrent topic in the nose and in your show in general. Uh, And so the other day, uh, I had a conversation with a friend uh, about one particular uh, sketch or skit in the the show years ago that was like a game show. Uh, gig, dweeb, or, or, or spaz. So I, I, you know, I didn't see that. Let me see where I can find that. Through that rabbit hole, I found out that all 39 seasons of SNL are available in Hulu. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, I was super curious because I looked at the first episode uh, hosted by George Carlin, and I really want to encourage people who have Hulu or could get Hulu to watch it. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great experience going back. And so now my binge watching will take, I don't know, a considerable amount of time <laughs> watching all 39 years of <laughs> right, the, the rest of your life. Part of my, is, the rest is, of my is, life. Is now yes. I'll plan. James Hanley, what have you got? Um, two very heavy duty books, but really worth reading about capitalism. One is Thomas Piketty, uh, who's a French economist, a Harvard economist, called Capitalism in the 21st Century, which is absolutely, I mean, it, it's intense, but very rewarding about reading about where capitalism is now. And another one, which is a little more accessible, Michael Lewis, Flash Boys, um, about the whole nature of high-frequency trading and the reason why um, investing is uh, very different for ordinary people as opposed to people who have high-frequency trading connections. All right, Susan Gill. I would like to endorse Jesus' wife and his brothers and sisters. They're a lovely family. And also endorse Tempest Toss, The Spirit of Isabella Beecher Hooker. My book launch party is at 7 o'clock on Wednesday at Harriet Beecher Stowe. Free food, live music, please come. All right, uh, so go there. Uh, that's when, Wednesday what time? 7. Seven. It's always good to repeat it. Um, all right, so I, since James is uh, being too uh, altruistic, uh, he's passing around the schedule for Trinity Sydney Studio. There are many exciting things, including um, The Wind Rises, which you, I think you do want to see on a big screen, right? Definitely. Um, it's amazing. Uh, and so check out the, the Trinity Sydney Studio schedule uh, in general because he's got a whole bunch of really exciting things coming up, many of which I will be at. All right. I may have already endorsed this once before. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but the remodeled Yale Art Gallery, which you may go into for free. There is no admission charge. Uh, And some of the things that they have done there are absolutely startling. And I've now been there. My son and I make a regular habit now of going there about, you know, well, almost every week. Um, And and so ranging from this kind of recreation of a buried uh, town from about 240 A.D., uh, and kind of an outpost post of the Roman Empire called Dura Europa, uh, which is sort of, I think, up and kind of near where Syria and Iran are now. Uh, it's just a remarkable thing, and you see all these different cultures coming together. It's, a, it's the best snapshot of the Roman Empire I've ever seen anywhere. I mean, it really, you really kind of get a sense of early Christians and Jews and Hellenic worshipers and, and people who worship, you know, a, a, a bull cult. And it just, it's unbelievable. So that's great. And then I've just been kind of wandering around uh, the museum on, on subsequent visits. Uh, last time, last Saturday, I was up in the room that has uh, three really, truly remarkable hoppers. Uh, but you you pick whatever you want. They they have they now have the space to exhibit what's a pretty remarkable collection, and and it's just a very rewarding day to spend your Saturday. So go to New Haven. You can go to the Farmers Market. Uh, it's indoors on Water Street. The regular old Worcester Square Farmers Market is indoors for the winter, and they really do have stuff. And then you go back downtown. You get a latte from Willoughby's. You walk around a little bit until you finish that, and then you go to the Yale Art Gallery, and you're having yourself a pretty good day uh, in the Elm City. So I want to thank uh, those wonderful panel today, Susan. And Campbell, James Hanley, Luis Figueroa. We'll be back on Monday with the scramble because that's all. Yeah. Talk about Torrington, Vernon, Danbury, Waterbury, Oliveberry, Woodbury, hitting on New Britain, Vernon. I already said that one. Avon, Farmington. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.
I'm Kion Wolf. Stephen Colbert, congratulations, man. It turns out that making fun of Bill O'Reilly leads to more success than actually being Bill O'Reilly.